As Chancellor of the University, I declare this congregation open to the conferring of degrees by the authority of the Senate and Council. Mr. Chancellor, my Lord, Lord Mayor, graduates, friends, relations, sponsors, visitors, and many other guests, it is a great pleasure as Vice Chancellor of the University of Leicester to welcome you to this degree ceremony. Degree congregations are really exciting times. They're unique occasions, they are celebrations. I hope. Like many degree ceremonies, this particular ceremony will for you last in your memory for many years. Degree ceremonies are the product of much hard work, but they're also the product of lots of other things as well. They're the product, I hope you all look very serious, they're the product of lots of fun, I hope, while you've been in Leicester. I hope that they're products of a lot of innovation that you've been involved with. I hope you've learnt a lot about the way in which academic staff do research, and I hope, most of all, that they are a celebration of your achievement. Today, the degree ceremony celebrates your academic status in gaining a degree from a leading British university. But I expect you might wonder, what kind of university are you graduating from? Because take yourselves back three years, four years, and you read our prospectus which told you something about the University of Leicester. The question is, has it changed? Well, during the period you have been here, you will, as the degree congregation program indicates, have witnessed several major changes and many major achievements. It is today a university of 17,000 students. Of the 17,000 students, 10% of them are international students drawn from overseas. It is a research-led university. And as those of you graduating today will know, that means that you get taught by people who are at the very edge of the subjects that they are working in. And they have taken you through to the very edge of the latest developments in many of the fields you have studied. Indeed, that kind of development finds its way into teaching programs, so that in the last two years, every department whose teaching has been evaluated externally has achieved a score of excellent. As far as the proportions of students are concerned, undergraduate and postgraduate students are approximately in equal number in this university. And in terms of the faculties that are graduating this morning, you can see particular distinctive records. The, departments, the Department of Economic and Social History, the School of Archaeology, have both been evaluated at the very top of their grade in the last research assessment exercise. Our Center for Mass Communications has been named as one of the top 10 departments in that field within the UK. There are many other things that one could mention, but those are just some of the highlights of the departments and centres uh, represented here this morning. But many departments offer postgraduate as well as undergraduate degrees. And we also offer degree programmes not only by face-to-face -face tuition, but also by distance learning. And this now constitutes approximately 6,000 of our students. In this respect, we offer a wide range of qualifications. So for those of you who thought that today marked the end of your association with the University of Leicester, I would argue that it actually opens up an opportunity. It is a beginning. Because given the range of qualifications that we offer, you can come back to us time and time again over the rest of your lifetime. I'm sure that will cheer you up at the notion that academic study is here to stay. 
and that is through the principle of lifelong learning. And to demonstrate that we very firmly believe in lifelong learning, we have in the university this year set up what we call an institute of lifelong learning to embrace a whole range of professional courses that can be taken alongside a full-time occupation. Similarly, emphasizing the importance of graduate study within our university, we have established a single university-wide graduate school so that the ways in which people can progress through the university are assisted by those particular bodies. But the opportunity to stay in touch with our university is not just through further study. We have a thriving alumni association and you are all automatically members of the Leicester Graduates Association. It is a way in which you can maintain links not only with the university, but also with the departments and centers with whom you've studied. In that respect, I shall look forward to meeting you again, not only today, but also in a whole range of different settings where the Alumni Association organize events in the coming year. Certainly, today, uh, we join you in celebrating success, celebrating the success of your teachers, your families, and yourselves. But what I want to do now is to get you to demonstrate your success. I'm going to do this in every degree ceremony, so you've got a chance to set the standard really high. What I want you to do at this point is to demonstrate, like all Leicester graduates, that you have really high standards. But the high standards that I want you to demonstrate are in the, in the area of applause. Because what I'd like you to do is let's give a round of applause to all your teachers, parents, and sponsors who've actually helped you to get to this degree ceremony today. The other graduates are going to have a job to beat that later in the week, so I think you've, you've set the standard reasonably well, but you're going to have to keep it up all through the ceremony because you need now to make sure you applaud each and every graduate who comes onto the platform because this is a celebration, and it's a celebration to applaud and to recognise the achievements of the graduating class of 2000 from the University of Leicester. We are graduating approximately just over 3,000 people over the next three days. Of those 3,000, th just over 2,000 were entered for bachelor's degrees that are classified in terms of first, upper second, lower second, third, and pass. And I'm delighted to say that this year of the graduating class of 2,000, uh, with just over 2,000 graduates, approximately 1,200 people obtained first and upper second class honours degrees. And that sets a considerable achievement both for this university and for the class of 2,000. Certainly, it's a splendid achievement, and I would like you to have a splendid day, and I wish you every success in your future careers. Our honorand, Reg Carr, has been entrusted with one of the most challenging jobs in all of academia, that of being the librarian of the Bodleian Library at the University of Oxford. For the many thousands of this library's regular readers, it remains today what it has always been, a rich and near inexhaustible treasure chest of material, supporting almost any branch of research and study one could imagine. This is a tradition which dates back to 1602, the hallmark of which has always, I beg your pardon, 
This is a, the hallmark of which has always been that the library should be open to anyone able to demonstrate a need to gain access to its amazingly diverse and deep contents. Its financial patron and restorer, the original stock having been plundered in Henry VIII's purge of Catholic literature, was Sir Thomas Bodley. In an era which was the apogee of England's post-Reformation period, Sir Thomas believed in the potency of the printed word to educate men, irrespective of creed, race, and class. Having established the Bodleian Library with those open-door principles, Bodley became, in effect, the seminal influence for the public libraries that we so readily take for granted today. With that ancient pedigree as a center of excellence and beacon for universal learning, it would be a brave person who accepted responsibility for its stewardship. To add to that, the pressures which accrue from the ever-increasing readership demands and an age in which electronic information and instantaneous communication have radically changed the face of librarianship, the post clearly calls for a person with very special talents indeed. It requires someone who could bring an historic institution into the 21st century without detracting from its ancient roots and traditions. Someone, too, who could embrace the full benefits of the exponential growth in information technology, yet implement them with sufficient sensitivity so as not to compromise the specialness and magic of the Bodleian. Enter our honorand. Reg Carr was brought up in the bomb-damaged Manchester of the post-Second World War. He recalls a very happy childhood and the development of a passionate interest in football. Interestingly, he was even then showing independence of thinking in that he was a Man United supporter while his neighborhood was staunch Manchester City people. Interestingly too, he was not only a keen spectator but a keen player, both at his school, the Manchester Grammar School, and at university thereafter. At Manchester Grammar, he discovered in the first form his affinity for modern languages. Fortunately, and unusually in those more insular days of the 1950s, he had an early experience of foreign culture when he spent some time with a family in provincial France. This led not only to his acquisition of fluent French, but also to the exposure to different societal lifestyles, an experience which left an indelible impression on him. On leaving school, he went to Leeds University to read French. It was normal for students to take a year out to teach French to the pupils of French Elysee. When he while he recalls very happy memories of teaching there, he found himself in a running battle with the school chef, who, in spite of being requested to cook Mr. Carr's steaks well done, steadfastly refused to do so. Eventually, after days of requests and refusals, the chef relented and brought it into the dining room personally, making reference to the deep barbecued sears he had made into the side of the meat. He growled, one burnt tiger for the Englishman. Decades later, the two ex-adversaries went on to relive fondly the memory of that occasion. However, one suspects that contra-typical views on team allegiance and cooking styles are not the sum total of Reg Carr's willingness to buck the established trend where he sees appropriate. These are qualities which were to equip him well for his distinguished future career. After graduating from Leeds with a first, he went to Manchester to do MA research on the links between the anarchist movement and the French writer Octave Merbeau. French literature of this period is a love of Mr. Carr, and he is regarded as a leading authority in the area. His library career began in Manchester, where he was to become librarian in charge of the School of Education Library. In 1976, he moved to become sub-librarian in reader services at the University of Surrey, and two years later, deputy librarian, first at Aston University, and then at Cambridge University Library. Thereafter, he returned to the University of Leeds, having been appointed Dean of Information Strategy, University Librarian, and the Keeper of the Brotherton Collection. It was during this period that Oxford were conducting a major review on their library, and Reg Carr was requested to provide an external assessment of how the library needed to grow appropriately into the 21st century. This he did, not realizing that the post he outlined in his recommendations for restructuring namely that of Director of University Library Services and Bodley's Librarian, would end up becoming his. In addition to all of this, he has acted as an external advisor and assessor to several universities, including Leicester, has played a key role in setting up the Consortium of University Research Libraries, and was chair of the Standing Conference of National and University Libraries. Yet another of his major achievements was to forge links with contemporaries in the USA, and in that capacity has now become chairman of the Research Libraries Group. 
Along the way, too, he has even been made an honorary citizen of Toyota City in Japan. Mr. Carr's contribution to academic libraries and universities, both in Great Britain and America, has been immense. All of us, graduates, postgraduates, and academic staff, have a great deal to thank him for, and it is a great pleasure for us to add to his list of honors today. Mr. Chancellor, on the recommendations of the Senate and the Council, I present Reginald Philip Carr, that you may confer upon him the honorary degree of Doctor of Letters. Sir, I think you need to be Doctor of Letters, welcoming among us. There you are. Congratulations. It is with very special pleasure that I introduce the world-renowned soprano Dame Felicity Lott to this degree congregation. Felicity Lott made her first recording at the age of two and a half when she sang Away in a Manger and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer on tape as a Christmas present for her grandmother. She grew up in a family where music was made, but she does not come from any sort of musical dynasty. She learned to play the piano and violin and sang in choirs, and had the benefit of excellent music teachers at school. She also acquired the nickname Flot, which has stayed with her for the rest of her life. She went to Royal Holloway College to read French, hoping to become an interpreter. She continued her singing, and again had excellent teachers. She went off to France for her third year as an assistant, again continuing her singing lessons, and one of her teachers there recognized her special talent, and sent her to the conservatoire, where she benefited enormously from the attentions of Madame Maximovich. A highlight of her time, a highlight at this time of her life, was singing in a choir at the opening ceremony of the Winter Olympics in 1968, which were held in Grenoble. She returned to England and enrolled in the Royal Academy of Music. She won the Principal's Prize, she jokes that it was only given to her because she was the oldest student there. She graduated in 1973 and began her professional career. In 1974, she came to Leicester to the newly opened Haymarket Theatre to sing Donna Elvira in Don Giovanni in a production mounted by Leicester University Opera. Dame Felicity remembers this production with great affection and tells me that it is the only time she has really enjoyed singing Donna Elvira. She returned in 1975 to sing Fiordilici in Cosi Van Tutti, so the University of Leicester can claim some tiny part in the career of this great singer. Dame Felicity was rejected three times by the Glyndebourne Opera Chorus before landing the part of the Countess in Capriccio, her favorite Strauss opera, on the company's winter tour. She became a Glyndebourne regular for over 20 years, missing only 1984 when her daughter was born. She slipped easily from being the beginner to being one of the old hands. In the intervening years, she has come to be particularly associated with the operas of Mozart and Richard Strauss. And in addition to regular performances at Glyndebourne, she has built up a close relationship with the Royal Opera House in Covent Garden. When pressed, Dame Felicity, Dame Felicity singles out for special mention John Cox's production of Capriccio and Rosencavalier, conducted by Carlos Kleiber. The roll call of her performances and of the musicians with whom she has appeared is quite simply a litany of the greats of modern music. She has performed worldwide in all the famous venues. Fame arrived and has been worn wonderfully lightly by Felicity Lott. Sometimes fame has a price. Some years ago, she was in music, singing in Munich, singing the Marscheline in Rosenkavalier. The first night had gone well, and there was a first night party. There was lots of champagne, a late dinner, general hilarity, and a late night to bed. The next day was hectic and demanding. An early start in order to visit Richard Strauss's house 
as the guest of Strauss's grandson and his wife. There was a lunch, lovely wine, more hilarity, lots of sunshine, followed by an early return to Munich. Felicity and her friend Rebecca Evans, who was singing Sophie in Rosen Cavalier, went to the opera house to see a performance of Figaro. Seats were obtained for them at the last minute, but not together. They met in the champagne queue at the interval and agreed that they were not enjoying it much, since the performer singing the Countess was obviously not very well. They decided to slip away quietly after a glass of champagne and have an early night. As they were on the point of departing, a message came for them over the loudspeaker, inviting them backstage. The Countess's voice had gone completely, and would Felicity sing the rest of the performance? There was a longer than usual interval as Felicity was got into costume, and a new Countess sang the rest of the opera. She received a wonderfully warm welcome from the audience. Dame Felicity is now very nervous about attending performances. <laughs> Dame Felicity is a renowned concert artist, having sung with all the major orchestras and at all the major festivals throughout the country. With Graham Johnson and others, she founded the Song Makers Almanac, which has established a series of recitals for song, sometimes coupled with readings, often involving more than a single performer, and sometimes themed, such as having all the songs being about love or about vice. She was awarded the CBE in 1990 and created a Dame Commander of the British Empire in 1996. The University of Leicester is delighted to be able to associate itself with a musician of such distinction. Mr. Chancellor, on the recommendation of the Senate and the Council, I present to you Felicity Anne Emwilla Lott that you may confer upon her the honorary degree of Doctor of Music. Adam, I give you the degree of Doctor of Music. We welcome you among us. Mr. Chancellor, Mr. Vice-Chancellor, my Lord Mayor, ladies and gentlemen, it really is a very special pleasure for me to be able to respond on behalf of Dame Felicity and myself on the university's most generous award to us of an honorary doctorate. Dame Felicity, I'm sure, will be used to seeing her name in lights and has already quite rightly had many honors heaped upon her. But I'm certain that today she, like me, will still have gone through that somewhat surreal experience of listening to the presenter speaking about us both in terms which only university presenters know how to use. <laughs> it all seemed vaguely familiar to me, but was that really me that the presenter was talking about? I have, of course, sat through many occasions like this in my own universities, listening to others being presented in similar fashion. I've even been privileged to play the part of a presenter myself at the University of Leeds. At least I did it once, they never asked me again, and I can't imagine why. But I never really stopped to wonder what it's actually like to be on the receiving end of such an embarrassingly sustained accolade. Well, now I know, and I can only say on behalf of Dame Felicity and myself, how very honored we feel to be spoken of in such terms and to be honored by the University of Leicester in such a way. Dame Felicity and I already shared a number of things in common, although you may not think so to look at us. In the first place, as you heard, we both graduated with BA honors in French, albeit at opposite ends of the country. And in the second place, Dame Felicity sings Mozart divinely, and I think Mozart is divine. <laughs> but there until today, the links between us ended. But now, with this award to us both of a Leicester doctorate, we also share something else very special in common. And I'm delighted to have had this opportunity to express publicly our shared gratitude to this university for this very great honor. 
And if I may be permitted just to say one final thing for myself as a university librarian amongst mostly university people, I'd like to conclude by saying that I'm particularly delighted by this honorary degree because I see it not simply as a personal accolade for whatever contributions I have, may have been able to make to the development of library and information services, but also as a recognition by a community of academic colleagues of the crucial part which is played by so many largely unsung university librarians in the whole academic enterprise of teaching, learning, and research. Mr. Chancellor, Mr. Vice-Chancellor, my Lord Mayor, ladies and gentlemen, you have done us both a very great honor, and we appreciate it very much indeed. We shall greatly treasure these awards, and we'll always think of Leicester with great affection, and perhaps even the occasional touch of pride. Thank you all very much. The graduands in the Faculty of Arts will be presented by the Dean, Professor Pierce. Will all graduands in the faculty please stand? Mr. Chancellor, I ask you to admit these candidates from the Faculty of Arts to the several degrees for which they are presented. Graduand of the Faculty of Arts. <coughs> By the authority of the Senate, I admit you to the several degrees which you are presented. For the degree of Doctor of Philosophy, Gary Campion. For the degree of Master of Arts in Archaeology and Heritage, James Alburn. <laughs> David Went. For the degree of Bachelor of Arts in Ancient History and Archaeology, Emma Buchanan. Marion. Marion Cooper. Rebecca Croson Towers. Lauren Dumford. Mark Ellis. Surinda Mauji. Andrew Michael Hayden Molyneux Jennifer Thompson Claire Willis For the degree of Bachelor of Arts in Archaeology Stephanie Baton Roberts. Helen Berrington. Helen Binns. Andrew Boyd. Lucy Burton. Sandy Bush. Richard Cooper. Anna Davis. 
James Dodd. Anna Falk. Heather Fitch. Lucy Griffin. Lucy Heaver. Harriet Jacqueline. Tracy Kent. Amanda Lewin. Catherine Martin. Zoe Miller. Michael O'Riordan. James Patrick. Alice Ramsden. Emma Rice. Robert Sayer. James Smith. Stephen Tamborello. John Tate. Emma Wells. Judith Westmacott. For the degree of Bachelor of Arts in Archaeology, European Union, Ben Wallace. For the degree of Bachelor of Arts in Archaeology and Sociology, James Wheelicker. Thomas Widger. For the degree of Bachelor of Arts in Combined Studies, Vanessa Alvarez. Gemma Badgett. Amanda Batson. Oliver Bainton. Julia Beck. Laura Bennett. Catherine Boyd. Helen Close. Keith Coles. Simon Cunningham. Benjamin Duft. Karen Darts. Jacqueline Dickman. Claire Donoghue. Paul Drover. Genevieve Dutton. Rosamond Edwards. Claire Ferguson. Shelley Francis. Emma Gardner. Victoria Gaylor. Kate Gordon. Victoria Grant. Amy Groom. Janet Gudgeon. Victoria Hammond. Sarah Hayton. Claire Hollingsworth. Judith Horton. Adam Humphrey. Melissa Humphrey. 
Elaine Hutchinson. Katie Jones. Susan Jones. Charlotte Jubb. Helen Keto. Tina Kumari Ladd. Michelle Lawrence. Catherine Lee. Catherine Lewis. Mary Lasasso. Helen Lowe. Catherine Mahoney. Alistair Marks. Ben Marshalsey. Kerry Martin. Beth McNeese. Brian Mellerick. Rosemary Miles. Kirsty Morgan. Olivia Mullins. Anne Murphy. Vikas Nair. Lucy O'Doherty. Bernadette Owen. Tamsin Pakman. Ruth Playford. Elaine Pohl. Lindsay Priest. Gavin Roberts. Dina Scarf. Philip Shade. Preeti Sharma. Rachel Slaughter. Emma Snowden. Helen Stevens. Helen Stovall. Olivia Suttle. Benjamin Sutton. Vincent Sinan. Joanna Tweedy. Julie Watkins. Andrew Whitworth. Michelle Williams. Alison Wood. Johanna Woodthorpe. For the degree of Bachelor of Arts in European Studies, Walter Aliani. Helen Burgess. Sally Cox. Elizabeth Davies. Celestian. Tracy Keane. Robin Knox. Ruth Nixon. Karen Pearson. 
Sarah Rushforth. Claire Sycamore. Michelle Thakar. Chloe Unwin. For the degree of Bachelor of Arts in French, Rebecca Allen. Grania Brock. Suzanne Comben. Nicholas Crate. Katie Frost. Rachel Geit. Lisa Hall. Stephen Lewis. Stephen Livings. Richard McMoon. Louise Mason. Lucille Ocpere. Sonal Prima. Emma Stuttard. Marie Schindler. Charlotte Taylor. Helen Waddington. Emily Watson. For the degree of Bachelor of Arts in French and German, Hannah Baud. Sarah Briggs. Carla Down. Joanna Gray. Victoria Logue. Deborah Lowe's. Vesna McKay. Joy Omoro Roby. For the degree of Bachelor of Arts in French and Italian, Claire Bishop. Stephen Burley. Bethan Clement. Molly Eden. Zoe Edwards. Louisa Fagg. Sally Howard. Sophia Hughes. Donna Malarkey. Natalia Staniskia. Richard Thomas. Philippa Wilkinson. For the degree of Bachelor of Arts in French and Politics, Francis Bell. Thomas Harris. Charlotte Hughes. Heather Stamford. Paul Sullivan. For the degree of Bachelor of Arts in Geography, Victoria Adnit. Louise Antill. 
Karen Atkinson. Gemma Barrett. Sam Black. Chloe Church. Graham Cornforth. Robert Eames. Janice Edwards. Graham Erskine. Anthony Finnegan. Rebecca Frampton. Simon Goddard. Leslie Hall. Yetta Halling. Richard Hammett. Dominic Harris. Roger Hislop. Rachel Hodd. Abigail Hooper. Thomas Castle. Tony Kennedy. Mark Lewis. Caroline Luckett. Jane Lusted. Stephen Lynch. John Matthews. Claire Morford. Matthew McKinney. Philip Palmley. Ben Perry. Aaron Pope. Daniel Potter. Claire Prout. Alex Raymond. Gideon Richards. Daniel Richmond. Christopher Riggert. Simon Riley. David Robinson. Christopher Sell. Michael Shackleton. Jordana Solon. Daniel Suwulu. Richard Starkey. Victoria Swift. James Thurman. Adrian Tovey. Kevin Turner. Michael Tyerman. Peter Watson. Kelly Wigfield. John Wilson. Timothy Yarnell. For the degree of Bachelor of Arts in German, Darren Bird. Yeah, 
Serena Clark. Laura Dale. Catherine Haywood. Rosalind Hewitt. Catherine Moran. Alison Taylor. For the degree of Bachelor of Arts in German and Italian, Melanie Hamm. Giovanna Panico. For the degree of Bachelor of Arts in History of Art, Katie Allen. Christine Barbie. Cassandra Bertels. Georgina Brody. Christine Burrell. Catherine Christ. Naomi Clark. Anne Cooper. Daniel Cooper. Natasha Eastwood. Jane Gifford Tiny. Mary Girgis. Joanne Gwither. Amy Hall. Charlotte Hampton. Lucy Ingham. Victoria Jackson. Beatrice Maggiore. Beth Moontree. Anna Polk. Johanna Reddington. Stephen Reynolds. Alison Shaler. Sarah Steele. Monisha Underhill. Stephanie Williams. Natalie York. For the degree of Bachelor of Arts in History of Art, European Union, Sarah Griffiths. Julie Hegarty. Thomas Latham. Gareth Mantle. Helen Poole. Kathleen Quirk. Lucinda Rome. For the degree of Bachelor of Arts in Humanities, Alison Barber. Siobhan Begley. Stuart Botham. Tim Groom. Sarah Ingram. Louise McCullum. Marianne Morris. Lynn Parker. 
Richard Sanson. Gerald Stacey. Diane Ward. Denise Wilcox. For the degree of Bachelor of Arts in World Humanities, Jack Bradshaw. Ronaldo Perez. John Silk. For the degree of Bachelor of Arts in Modern Language Studies, Pia Brooks. Sandra Koch. For the degree of Bachelor of Arts in Modern Language Studies with a Year Abroad, Emma Arpino. Helen Avery. Rachel Bedford. Sarah Buxton. Amanda Henshaw. Kelly Hurt. Scott Kennedy. Amy Lazarus. Kate Litherland. Susan Moat. Caroline Osler. Anna Powell. Elaine Randall. Sarah Reese. Barnaby Short. Lindsay Stamper. Juliet Stead. Naomi Thompson. Mr. Chancellor, I ask you to admit to the several degrees for which they are presented by my faculty those candidates who are absent. By the authority of the Senate, I admit those candidates who are absent to the several degrees to which they are presented. The graduands in the Faculty of the Social Sciences will be presented by the Dean, Dr. Negreen. Will all graduands in the faculty please stand? Mr. Vice-Chancellor, I ask you to admit these candidates from the Faculty of the Social Sciences to the several degrees for which they are presented. Graduands of the Faculty of the Social Sciences, by the authority of the Senate, I admit you to the several degrees for which you are presented. For the degree of Doctor of Philosophy, Victoria Bradley. Roger Few. Robert Fish. Elizabeth Poole. Anne Robbins. J. 
Jennifer Sievers. Christopher Taylor. For the degree of Master of Arts in Mass Communications, Nasreen Bashir. Roger Bran. Neve Burns. Gareth Hutchins. Victoria Hilton. Graham Leftwich. Peter Lowe. Kristin Milner Morov. Connie Monk. Jesse Nascimento. Rosalind Pearson de Garcia. Lindsay Scott. Beatrice Tarquin. Eamon Timmins. Ben Williams. For the degree of Bachelor of Arts in Geography, Nicholas Baker. James Barrows. Stephanie Butt. Natalie Cork. Lynn Darby. Michelle Doherty. Sarah Durrington. Stephen Flack. Suzanne Fennelly. Congratulations. Deborah Fox. Congratulations. Michelle Gerard. Congratulations. Dawn Hardy. Congratulations. David Hope. Congratulations. Andrew Hopkins. Marie Keenan. Sophie Kendall. Sarah Lace. Claire Laver. James Leach. Lisa McCrindle. Catherine Moody. Denise Poso. Stephen Quinn. Hugh Roberts. Robert Wadsworth. Michelle Walker. Alexandra Webb. Rachel Williams. Alexander Yates. For the degree of Bachelor of, in, of Arts in Geography and Economic and Social History, Peter Cansdale. John Clayton. Christopher Devlin. Caroline Emery. John Rochester. Simon Tollett. 
for the degree of Bachelor of Science in Communication and Society, Shamiza Ahmed. Charity Baker. Daniel Bauscher. Tristan Brooks. Congratulations. Benjamin Cook. Congratulations. Louise Craig. Congratulations. Gillian Crew. Congratulations. Frederica de Cristofaro. Congratulations. Chris Dempster. Congratulations. Claire Dickinson. Congratulations. Laura Eason. Congratulations. Gary Harkness. Congratulations. Jody Harris. Congratulations. We'll see you next year. <laughs> Barry Hobday. Congratulations. Lindsay Hobday. Congratulations. Christopher Holmes. Congratulations. Stephanie Howarth Chung. Congratulations. Carly Hubbard. Congratulations. Louise Lever. Congratulations. Adrian Luckman. Congratulations. Jacqueline Lynch. Congratulations. Guthrie Miller. Congratulations. John Naismith. Congratulations. Robert Noble. Congratulations. Rose Oliphant. Congratulations. Nicola Parker. Congratulations. Matthew Peachy. Congratulations. Dina Rana. Congratulations. Catherine Rowlinson. Congratulations. Anna Thames Locking. Congratulations. Sarah Thomas. Congratulations. Amy Todd. Congratulations. Sarah Wadsworth. Congratulations. Ben Walker. Congratulations. Neil Watson. Congratulations. Rosanna Weinberg. Congratulations. Andrew West. Congratulations. Laura Wilkinson. Congratulations. Laura Wilson. Mr. Vice-Chancellor, I ask you to admit to the several degrees which they are presented by my faculty, those candidates who are absent. By the authority of the Senate, I admit those candidates who are absent to the several degrees for which they are presented. Let me begin by congratulating our honorary graduates. Their presence here today emphasizes the continuity of learning. The fact that what you learn at university is just the first step on a long process in life, where you put to use in one way or another all that you have learned. Our honorary graduates provide role models to which you can aspire. And I'm sure that several decades from now, some of the younger members of the audience 
will be back in a more senior capacity. But this graduation is primarily for the benefit of the junior members who have worked hard to earn their degrees. For you, this is a great occasion and one for us all to celebrate. I know that many of you have relatives and friends. We've heard, about, heard from them during the ceremony today. And they're here to support you, and they also deserve congratulations for their contribution in helping you. And finally, we should not forget your teachers, many of whom are also here, since they will be delighted that their efforts have been successful in seeing you through to your graduation. And in welcoming you all, let me give a special welcome to those of you who have come from abroad, perhaps visiting Leicester for the first time. We are very pleased that you made the effort to come, and we hope that you have enjoyed the occasion. We all know that we are living in an era of rapid change. The world scene has been radically transformed in the past decades. The great political and military divide symbolized by the Berlin Wall has gone. We live in a world which, while not exactly at peace, is no longer under the permanent threat of instant annihilation. Democracies are, on the whole, praising dictatorships. New parts of the world are developing into advanced economies. The scientific technological revolution is having a profound impact in a way which is only just being glimpsed. And young people graduating today will live in a quite different environment from their parents and grandparents. It is a more interesting but more complicated world. One can perhaps draw an analogy here between the scientific and political spheres, and of course, there is a link between the two. The modern scientific era began with the Newtonian view of the universe as governed by simple laws, which in principle enabled one to predict the future in a methodical way. In the 20th century, this view has been transformed by things like quantum mechanics, with its famous uncertainty principle, and chaos, which shows that Newtonian prediction does not apply in complex situations. Similarly, in the political world, the ideas of a simple, rational world run on utopian ideas involving planned economies has been replaced by a more complex and diverse picture of reality. These great political and economic changes have had a major impact on the importance of education. We hear everywhere about the knowledge-based economy, where the secret of success lies not in raw materials or large factories, but in the trained intellectual resources of the country. So around the world, the demand for education, particularly higher education, has grown enormously. We see this here in Leicester, where the university has continued to expand at a rapid rate. And while this is necessary and welcome, there are a few practical drawbacks, one of which is that the Chancellor has had to enlist the assistance of the Vice-Chancellor in the handshaking of the ceremony. But let me assure all of you that your degree retains its full value, whoever shakes your hand. <laughs> but what effect do all these changes in the outside world have on the individual student who is graduating here today? In former times, when society was more rigidly organized, the individual had little choice. The son followed in the father's occupation, and of course, the daughter had even less choice. The future was predictable, but usually bleak. Now the situation is totally reversed. Barriers have broken down, and there's a great deal of choice, which itself makes for difficulties, and there are vast opportunities. In return, we have more uncertainty. The future is less predictable, but at least we have hope. So for the individual, education has broadly three roles. It is first the gateway to opportunity. Without a good education, you would have much less choice of possible avenues for the future. The training that universities provide is your entree to the modern world. But democratic societies require more than just a trained workforce. They require educated citizens who can make critical and informed judgments. In a world obsessed by publicity and propaganda, it is hard to distill the truth from the welter of pseudo-information that floods around us. A sound democracy can only flourish if its citizens can think clearly for themselves and not become passive absorbers of what the media, the government, and industry dish out for us. Finally, education should open the door to personal and intellectual fulfillment. 
We must not only think, but we must enjoy thinking. Universities are there to introduce us to the great thoughts and creations of the past, to enable us to participate in the culture of the present, and to help to pass it on to the next generation. The University of Leicester is proud of its contribution to your education and hopes that you will leave here with happy memories. We would like to keep in touch with you in the future. Since education, as the Vice Chancellor said, is now a lifelong process, you may return here at some time in the future. You may also send your children, your students, or your friends here for their education. It remains for me to give you my best wishes for the future and to allow you to continue to celebrate your graduation with your relatives and friends. I now declare this congregation closed.